first of all, thanks a lot for the, for the invitation. I think it's one of my favorite events here. It's uh, the right size, not too big, not too small. Um, so it's very good to have the conversations. Hopefully, after my talk, still the opportunity to discuss the details with, with all of you. So um, the topic of my, of my talk is about um, artificial intelligence and what it means like for open source and for Nextcloud specifically. Uh, first, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm doing open source, I think, since the term open source exists, um, 25 years, yes, I'm old, I know, um, <laughs> in lots of different roles in the KDE community, um, was involved in a number of other projects, um, helped a bit, little bit with the W3C, um, helped to develop the ActivityPub uh, standard, um, working with the United Nations on their uh, open source strategy, um, doing a lot of lobbying nowadays for open source on the European level, um, but I think I'm mostly um, invited here as the founder and um, CEO of, of Nextcloud. So um, what motivated me to start this whole thing, like over 10 years ago, was basically that. Um, so it was clear that we're moving to a future where like five big companies control all the data, all communication, all collaboration, everything online. Um, this is where when like all these web services like Dropbox and, and Gmail and other services popped up. Um, for me, this was a, a dystopia. Uh, I don't want to live in a world where like everything we do is just controlled by a handful of um, closed source proprietary companies from the other side of the planet. Um, so this is why I, I founded Nextcloud to be like the the alternative that is completely open source and uh, can be hosted yourself. And because of that is like privacy uh, friendly. So a um, little bit about Nextcloud. Most of you, who in the audience knows Nextcloud? OK, <laughs> I can keep the introduction short. Um, so what we do um, is like we have like four different core parts. Nextcloud files for the file sync and share, talk for chat and video conferencing, groupware for mail, calendar contacts, and office for editing office documents, and everything under the umbrella of Nextcloud Hub. So this is really similar structured as our competitors from Microsoft and Google. They have similar components, and this is also um, what we do. As, we, as I said, the main difference is um, that we are fully open source, 100% not open core anything, 100% open source, and because that is, um, it runs on-premise. <clears throat> With on-premise, I mean you can really install it like on a small Raspberry Pi for yourself, for your friends and family. That's totally cool. Um, but it can also run like for a lot more users. So the biggest installations we have has uh, 20 million users. So it really scales from very small to very big. That's a big service provider in, in South America. Um, but it's also used like in Europe, for example, the Magenta Cloud from a German telecom is based on Nextcloud for, with 3.6 million users. And it's basically the same software. It's, I think it's quite interesting. It really runs on a Raspberry Pi and a huge Kubernetes cluster. So this is what we do, a little bit about the, the components itself. I mean, most of you know it. This is the interface for the, um, for the file sync and share part. It's just to manage your files and documents. There's Nextcloud Talk for chat and video conferencing. This is like obviously the chat UI, but you can press a button, turn it into a call. Again, everything self-hosted. No bit is like leaving your network if you don't want it. Um, then there's a calendar, of course, with all the sharing features, um, synchronized with your phone, everything you expect. Um, a mail client with all the usual features you expect, quite powerful, like can basically do most of the things that Gmail can do or everything. And there's an Office component for editing your Office documents. So this is what we do. We are the full alternative to these big tech companies. Life was good a year ago. Um, and then came AI. Um, and to be honest, I got a little bit of a depression at the time <laughs> because of two problems. First of all, can we even compete anymore? Can we, as an open source community, with just a few people, um, can we compete with these big tech companies? Is there a way to really do something similar what they are doing? Um, also, the infrastructure, right? As I said, it should run on-premise, on small devices, Raspberry Pis at home. At a time, it was in the press that you need gigantic server clusters to do AI. Is this even possible to be self-hosted? 
This was the one question, can we do it? And the second question is, should we do it? Because, as you might know, the whole AI thing comes with a lot of questions and challenges. So, obviously, it's a tool that can be very useful. Right? It can be your assistant, your helper, someone who really takes away like boring things, can automate things, and it can really, really help you to be yeah, just more productive, basically. But obviously, there's also the dark side of it. There's also all the problems. I will cover a few of them. And the question is then, OK, we as Nextcloud, as an ethical organization, we want to bring like software to the world that helps people. So should we even do this with AI? Or are the negative sides like too negative, basically? So, um, and we are not the only ones with these concerns. I mean, this is just a bit out of the press. There are companies like Apple and Samsung and Goldman Sachs and many others. They are blocking the use of ChatGPT. And then you might wonder, okay, why is that? Um, because they're really concerned about, first of all, concerned about misinformation. They might get answers that are not true, which isn't harming them. And the second is the whole question around privacy. Um, because obviously, if you copy your contracts and whatever documents into ChatGPT, well, they have the information. But this is not fundamentally different than other cloud services. The fundamental difference is that this is then used for training of the model. So it's absolutely possible that if someone from, let's say, Airbus is discussing some construction plans in ChatGPT, then later, a other person comes from Boeing, who is asking a questions and gets answers that are based on the information of the competitor. Right? And this is, of course, a not risk that cannot be calculated. This is why a lot of companies ban the use of these public um, AI services. And this led us to a lot of discussions um, internally and also with some experts. And so a little bit over a year ago, we did two things. First of all, we founded a dedicated team to work on these AI features. And, and second is, we, because we wanted to try if it's possible to compete, and the second is that we are started this initiative that we called um, Ethical AI at the time to really, really question what we are doing and if this is really yeah, ethical and helpful. Obviously, ethical, that's a big word, right? and a lot of people understand different things under the term ethical, so it is important to really structure this a little bit more. We can just say, well, we are the good ones. Okay, sure, but why? What's different? So we really have to go into a little bit more detail. So what we did is why then we looked into like potential problems. And this was not hard to look for because it was all, all over the press, or it's still all over the press, and we identified a few critical questions around AI. The first question is the thing around discrimination. Because as you know, these large language models, they are trained on information on the internet, um, and um, it gives back information based on the internet. And Obviously, as you know, the internet is full of discrimination, and obviously these AI systems also give you discriminatory answers. So if you ask like an image generation tool to, hey, can you please generate a photo of a doctor? You probably got to get a photo of a white man, obviously, because that's what is found on the internet. And that's obviously a problem. Um, we want to do something better here. The second question is, the CO2 footprint, because as I mentioned, there are these gigantic server farms are needed with GPUs and consuming a lot of power. And the question is, what are we doing here? I mean, are we, because AI is now cool, accelerating like climate change here? Or what is really the consequence of, 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 the, of the actions here? Um, next point is the privacy question. I already mentioned it. There's data leakage, not only by like normal leakage of documents on some cloud services, but by training data, which is quite interesting. There's a complete new, um, a new dimension, which is not covered by normal laws. So the leaking is indirect. Yeah. And then, of course, there's the last question. Is this even like available for everybody? Because one of the strong points of open source that I really believe in is that we are building and creating software that can be used by everybody on the planet. Right? Even if you're in, some, in the global south somewhere and you don't have so many resources, you cannot really have the money to buy like a Microsoft subscription or the OpenAI subscription or something. We want to provide technology that's use, usable by everybody, even without 
money, obviously. And how is this with AI? Is this like our only paid feature in the future? Or how, how does this work? So this um, led us, after a lot of discussion, to this ethical AI framework that we developed. It works like that, that we developed this traffic light system from red, which is not so ethical, to green, which is ethical in our definition. And of course, the question is, how do you measure that? So we identified like three requirements, um, how we measure that. The first is that the source code should be open source. Why is this important? First of all, if the source code is open source, you can run it yourself. That's very important. And second is, you can also then measure the energy consumption. Because just a SaaS service on the internet, you cannot measure anything. You just use it. If you use Google and uh, you ask Google or Microsoft, hey, how much power do you consume, you don't get an answer. And they probably don't really care because the money in their case comes from somewhere else. This is all subsidized from other channels. So the energy consumption can only be measured if it's open source and you can also then optimize it. And there are lots of examples. If you like tools like PyTorch, for example, with every release gets better and better, more efficient. And this is only possible because it's open source and transparent. Second is the training models should be freely available. And because only if they're available, you can take them and run them locally. And then you can make sure that no data is leaking anywhere else. Right? And this is something, if you look at GBT3 or uh, GBT4, obviously the model is not available. It just exists only in the infrastructure of OpenAI. You can access it through a web service, but you cannot really take it and run it locally. So running it locally is very important. And the third requirement is that the training data should be available. Because only if you can look into the training data, you can check for biases, and if you find problems, you can actually fix them and improve it. Otherwise, it's just a black box. You say, yeah, there's some intelligence in there, but you don't know what the basis of it is. So we have these three requirements. Um, and based on the three requirements, we give these traffic light um, symbols. Basically, if none is available, it's red. This would be something like the Gemini stuff from Google or the uh, ChatGPT stuff, where none of it is the case, um, until green, where everything is, is checked. And these are the more yeah, ethical tools, and I will talk about them in a, in a second. Um, and exactly, um, as I said, we show those traffic lights to our users when they install different components. Because in Nextlot, we actually have integration into ChatGPT or DALI, if you really want to. But then on the install page, you see like the red traffic light. Right? You then see what you're doing, hopefully. Hopefully, you understand what it means. Um, it's your decision, um, but hopefully, hopefully, uh, obviously we provide like the more ethical solutions too. So this is an example of the settings page. So in every case, um, like here for example with the translation system, you can choose. You can for example say, hey, I want to use the ChatGPT API for translating documents in Nextcloud. Or you can say, no, I want to use the Opus model from the University of Helsinki, which runs completely local and is, according to our definition, completely ethical and completely open source and transparent. And you can host it yourself, even on a Raspberry Pi. And the same for other things. For example, our speech-to-text system. Again, you can use like a whisper service from OpenAI, or you can use something that runs completely local and no data is leaking anywhere else. So this is something where we always give the options so that people can decide um, what to do. But as I said, obviously, we, with our uh, internal team, we focus on developing only open source and the local AI systems, obviously. Again, if you want to, you can use something else. But we put our energy into the ethical area here. So now I want to give you some, um, some examples uh, what we actually do there. Um, there's a number of AI um, features that we developed already a while ago. Um, for example, we have face and object recognition in our Nextcloud photos area. So as you know, you can synchronize your photos with Nextcloud, and you can detect then if this is a cat or mouse or bicycle or whatever. You can search for it, which is very nice. Similar, as you know, from Apple and Google and other systems. But again, this runs completely local. No data is sent anywhere else. 
Same as with face recognition, where you can group your family members nicely together automatically, but again, no data is leaking anywhere else, everything on device. And, and the same with some other features like related resources, uh, recommended of shares, um, and many other things. So these are features we already developed roughly two years ago. But as I said, like a year ago, we really stepped up the effort and said, OK, let's see what we can do. Is there a way to do some features in an ethical way, in an open source way, and completely local? So some examples. Um, there is a Nextcloud Assistant that we developed. This is using a large language model. This runs is 100% open source, and this is completely self-hosted. I need to speed up a bit here. I, I saw already. Sorry for that. Um, and it can do uh, lots of things. For example, first of all, it has like the standard prompt, right? You can ask any questions, and you get um, some answers, um, just as you expect. But the really interesting thing is the integration into the applications of Nextcloud. For example, in text, so let's say you have a document, you have a text document that you're working on, um, you can mark any text. There's this assistant pop-up coming up. You can say generate a headline or summarize or translate in another language. And it just does something. In this case, generates a headline. And you can just um, copy it and insert it. Um, so this is very helpful um, to work with text. And as I said, you can summarize it or make it longer or shorter or, or change the, the wording. So that's a very useful feature. Then in Nextcloud Mail, we have an integration that we have the priority inbox on the left side, which shows you the important mails. And here's a feature where you can summarize email threads. So maybe you get like long email threads. You can get a nice summary of what is discussed if you don't have the time to read everything that your, um, that your friends and colleagues are sending you. Then, of course, there's a way to uh, write emails. Um, you can say, hey, I want to have this mail, this invitation to this, this event, and can generate a mail from you. Again, everything I'm showing you is completely running, completely local. From my understanding, we are the only ones who can do this completely local as open source. Every other tools, like Gmail and Outlook and the others, uh, use the cloud for that. Um, then in Nextcloud Talk, um, we have features where we can automatically translate chat messages from one language to another. If you speak with colleagues, I mean, we at Nextcloud, we have colleagues in 22 countries, so we're very international. You can automatically translate it. Um, this is very useful. Then you can uh, also generate some images and post it directly into a chat. Every talk needs a cat picture, of course. So here's the cat picture um, that's generated, and you can use it directly in your chat conversation if you want. Then there's the assistant. It's also directly available here. You can, in the middle of a discussion, say, hey, assistant, what are the five most important things, blah, 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 and it gives you some output. It's basically like a real assistant that you can just trigger at any time in a, in a chat conversation. Then there is a dictation system where you want to dictate like emails or text messages. There's a dictation system using Whisper, again, completely local and open source. In video calls, in Nextcloud Talk, there's, of course, the option to record the call. And there's also the option to generate a transcript of the call, even with a summary. So after every call, you can get a transcript. And we can even identify to-dos in the call there and then assign them to the people by just talking about it. It's actually quite cool. And kudos to the Whisper project here, of course. And there are some other features, like classifying documents. We can detect, oh, this is a document that contains like social security numbers or other things. So we can, um, we can um, detect that. So these are the, all the features we developed in the last 12 months. And I'm actually quite happy what we are able to do. Um, and I want to give you a little bit of a preview of what comes out in two weeks. Um, because what we did so far is mostly like catching up. But I think we can also do some innovative things. So the first thing we will release in two weeks is something that we call context chat. And this is actually quite innovative. And it works like that, and that all the content in your next cloud, like chat messages, email, documents, are indexed and stored in a vector database. That's a new type of database, which works like in a multi-dimensional way, which can build relations between different tokens. And it, there's an open source tool called LangChain that we integrated. And this means that you have an assistant that knows your data. So you can ask the assistant, hey, can you please here, for example, um, can you summarize um, all the emails from Ross from the last week? And because the assistant knows all my emails, and give you a summary of what was in the mail from last week. Or you can say, 
hey, this is a project management board with all the different to-dos. Can you please summarize how to typically organize an event? And because the system knows all the tickets and can actually understand the relations between the tokens and can give you a real answer. So from my understanding, this is quite innovative. There is, Microsoft has something called Business Chat. Um, they have that, but of course, um, in the cloud. Uh, Google announced something like that, but I think it's not production ready yet. But this is actually, um, we can do here completely local. And this also runs on your, uh, your, your Raspberry Pi if you want. You need a little bit of more storage because of the big index. Um, but this works fine, completely local. And there are some other things we are doing. For example, there's a feature called Context Writer. So we can generate a document that is, um, from a format perspective, based on another document. For example, you can say, hey, can you please write me a blog post about this and this topic? But very similar to this existing blog post. So it can use this as input and can generate like, nice text there. And there are other things, for example, summarization of talk messages. So if you go into a chat room and you just don't have time to read like, what all your colleagues and friends are discussing, you can say, hey, give me a summary, and I get a summary of the, of the history. And there's other things like suggested email answers where you can say, okay, give me a possible answer to this email. Uh, again, um, completely local and open source. So the summary is, um, I think I've overcome my depression a bit from a year ago because uh, there is a lot we can do. It's really amazing. The open source community is amazing. I don't know how many of you know uh, the Hacking Face community. There's a gigantic community of who are constantly working on, this, on these models with all the tools. Um, and some of the things are really more advanced than what comes from the commercial companies. So there's a lot we can do. There's everything we can do local. There's no need for the huge clouds here. Um, and I think with our ethical system, we can also put this a bit into perspective uh, to have the different ethical AI ratings to say, okay, maybe this is a bit critical from a, a privacy perspective, but this is not because it runs completely local and is uh, transparent and there's no bias in it. So for me, this is the positive ending. Um, again, it shows the, the power of the open source community that we are actually not um, like, I don't know, surpassed by big tech companies but there's still something we can do, which is uh, provide nice privacy-friendly tools to everybody. Thanks a lot. Any questions for Frank? Yes, hello. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. I have one comment, if I may, and then one, one question. I think on the ethical side, it's all very interesting, your three criteria, but it's not guaranteed that it's ethical, right? Because data may be available, but still biased. Yeah. And you may know the source or how it works, but still do uh, bad things with your, with your model. So I guess there also there's a, a risk that people see a green light and think, okay, that's fine. But actually, if you don't go yourself, because there are many data sets that have been used that are known, and we still discover that there are a lot of issues because nobody looked so yeah. this Leon uh, thing, uh, Leon thing, uh, where people didn't look into closely into the data, although they were uh, known already. Uh, my question is: Your assistant, the LLM, is it one that you train yourself, or did you use one, or how, how did you approach the yeah. uh, LLM aspect? Thank yeah. you. So first of all, to the first comment, I mean, I completely agree, and um, that's what I tried to say earlier. Maybe not clear enough. Ethical is a big topic, and I'm not saying this is all like super ethical according to every definition. But I think that transparency is important. If the source code is transparent, you can see what's happening. If the training data is transparent, you see what's in there. I think this is the requirement to make sure that the system is good. Obviously, it is possible to have a transparent system, which is still shitty, of, of kind of, I know. <laughs> but at least then we have the way to see it and to improve it. And the second question, no, we, we are not in the position to um, like train our own like foundation models. That's like, this indeed requires a lot of resources. But there are actually lots of them um, um, available according to our definition. The LAMA model uh, from, uh, from Meta, but there's the training data is not, um, not transparent. But there are also other ones like the Falcon model or the Mistral model from France. So there are actually some available. And what we do is we're trying to fine-tune them. For example, there is a collaboration uh, we do with the, in Germany with the state of Schleswig-Holstein, 
where they provide like training data and there's a process called fine tuning where we can build like a model that is like specialized for this use case. So we're not in the position to build our own foundation models that not now. Uh, Frank, thank you for the talk. Really interesting to see you pushing forward, especially running AI locally, right? Mm -hmm. To preserve privacy and uh, letting companies and individuals to take control over their data. Uh, regarding uh, having other requirements, allowing uh, people to see training data. So uh, I, I work with the OSI, we're working on the open source AI definition, and we're having hosting a lot of discussions around that. And that's a big topic around the training data and the data in general. There are a lot of issues. It's not as simple as that. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, very sensitive data uh, for, for training uh, those models and copyrightable work as well. So uh, sometimes, maybe even oftentimes, the ethical uh, choice is not to provide the training data in full because imagine like um, medical records, right? Or anything that has sens sensitive data. Even though that training data can be valuable, uh, sometimes you have to make it transform it into synthetic data and hide uh, anonymize that data uh, to make it valuable and to uh, mm. preserve privacy. So you might want to review that requirements and I invite you and everyone here who wants to join uh, those discussions at discuss.opensource.org to think about those, uh, those questions. Yeah, yeah thanks. Yeah. I had no time to mention that, but I really like it a lot that the OSI is working on an official open source um, AI definition. And I was part of some workshops there already, and I'm really happy that it actually goes in a similar direction. Um, the question of training data, it is of course complicated. So as you said, there's the aspect of privacy. Um, I think this is, still, this is relatively easy because if you Let's, let's say you take like medical data, which contains the names of the patients. You might hope that the names are not like exposed, but it's possible. So I think it's pretty clear that from a privacy perspective, the, the training data needs to be anonymized. From a copyright perspective, it's more complicated. Um, I think this is still a process. Um, I mean, there's a lawsuit in the US, uh, several lawsuits. I mean, the New York Times is suing OpenAI at the moment about exactly that. If this is a copyright violation, if you take proprietary data for training process, this is an ongoing, ongoing discussion. Uh, we have, for example, a feature that I don't, had no time to mention, but we can also classify music in Nextcloud. Um, and uh, you can upload your MP3s or whatever, and then you can structure them in if this is classic music, this is rock music, and so on. And for that, um, this is not a model from us, this comes from somewhere else. This is, for example, using um, a f a music from Spotify, which obviously is copyrighted. Right? And this is a big question, if this is a copyright violation or not. Um, but I think this is something for the legislation to, to figure out. Yeah. All right, thank you, Frank. Thanks a lot. Yeah.